Good morning, everyone. It is so nice to see you with us this morning. My name is Tara Rodriguez. I'm the director of the Division of School and Program Improvement at the Kentucky Department of Education. And I have some colleagues on the call with me this morning, if you all would like to introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm David Malanti, one of the assistant directors in the division. Good morning, I'm Erin Suddeth, and I'm the Title I Part A branch manager. Good morning, I'm Melissa Farrell. I'm the state coordinator for the Homeless Education Program. Thank you again for joining us this morning. I know you all have very busy schedules, so really appreciate you're taking the time to spend some time with us this morning. Uh, we have several different topics to uh, talk to you about this morning, so we'll go ahead and get started with some logistics, and I'll start sharing the um, the, the slide deck with you, which uh, Aaron sh has sent with you this morning, so you should have a copy of that. All right, if you have any questions uh, or comments during the call, you can make those in the chat box, or if you would like to send them uh, by email, uh, you can do that at, at by sending me an email at the, at the address shown on the screen. The webinar will be recorded and posted on the Title I Documents and Resources webpage. And again, if you could please mute because it, it gets a little hard to hear if, uh, if, if we can hear other people's mics. All right, so a recap from our August webinar. We had we shared with you some parent and family engagement resources. Uh, we talked with you about some district requirements questions on the GMAP application and then had some updates and reminders for you. Today, we will be again providing some GMAP application updates and reminders. That will be Erin will be sharing those and she will also provide a brief overview of comparability and some updates to the monitoring checklist. And then Missy will be talking with us about the provisions of one of our state regulations, uh, 704 KAR 7-090, the Homeless Children Education Program. And so let's go ahead and get started. Erin, um, do you want to uh, take it over and talk with us about some GMAP application updates and reminders? Sure. Let's see. All right. I'll just um, let you click through the slides, Tara. I can't find okay. my, my button for that. Um, no problem. All right, good morning, everybody. So uh, just a couple little updates and things from me. First of all, the FY 2022 application was due on August 31st, and I'd really like to just thank all of the coordinators for their hard work getting those turned in. We had a lot of people turn them in earlier on time, and a lot of consultants have been remarking about um, the, the really good quality that the applications are this year. So that's really great, um, and we appreciate that. As a reminder, we do have several years worth of applications that are still currently open. Um, so be sure that you're checking your FY 19, 20, 21 application in GMAP just to make sure that um, you've made any revisions and that it is uh, consultant approved. Also, we have a lot of really great resources available to help you with your application, as well as um, some stuff on our web page. So within GMAP, we have the help for current page feature, of course, for every page. On our web page, we have the GMAP training video series that was updated this year. And then the last one is, of course, your district's KDE consultant. Um, supporting you with technical assistance is a huge part of our jobs. So our goal is to help you just create that quality Title I program. And um, please do not hesitate to reach out to us with any question, no matter what it is. Um, we're always happy to help. And the last item on this slide is just a little reminder um, in general about avoiding creating a program silo in your district. You just want to ensure that multiple district staff are you know, familiar with the program, the application process, things like that. In the event that something happens, maybe someone is injured or ill and they're out and something needs to be you know, addressed or turned in, someone else in the district can um, handle that. All right, next. Sorry, Aaron. Just <laughs> give fine. me a second here. I might have to go out and might have to go out and share it again. Okay, can you see it? Yes. 
Yeah, it is still not wanting to let me advance. Just give me a second. <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. All right. So a uh, comparability report, the, the season is upon us and SS section 1118C requires districts to demonstrate that services provided in your Title I serve schools are comparable to those provided in non-Title I schools prior to the expenditure of Title I funds. And the goal of comparability is to ensure that this Title I money is being used to supplement the educational experiences of disadvantaged youth. And in Kentucky, we complete this comparability report workbook every October and upload it into GMAP for KDE approval. The information on the report must be taken between the last day of the second school month and October 31st of the current school year. Now, typically that is September 30th through October 31st inclusive, but it can be dependent on the district's calendar because a month is uh, classified as 20 teaching days, but it's probably September 30th through October 31st. I think I caught a couple of you um, who tried to get ahead of the game and upload it early, but you can't pull the data until today. So um, that's important. The comparability reports for this year are going to be due on November 1st. Just a couple reminders about the report. You can download the template in the GMAP district document library, and you can see an image there on the screen. You'll just click that link that says edit documents, and that will download the template for you. Uh, it is a, a pretty large file, so it might take a minute for it to download and save and everything, so don't worry about that. Uh, we do ask that you save the file with this naming convention, and that is the uh, school year your district name, and then the abbreviation comp rep. This just helps us as consultants as we're looking through, you know, lots of applications and, and reports, we can keep track of whose is whose. Um, also, it is a macro enabled spreadsheet. So the first thing you're gonna do when you open it is click a little enable content button at the top of the screen and then save it. That'll make sure that all of the features of the spreadsheet work correctly. Okay, next. We do have a, a comparability guide and a comparability report training video, and both of those provide step-by-step -step instructions on completing the report. The training video I just updated, and we uh, got that uploaded yesterday, so that is brand new um, for this year. Uh, districts should use their school's enrollment summary report, and that's located in Infinite Campus via the pathway Student Information Reports to complete the spreadsheet. It's really important to save the reports that you use to complete the comparability report. In the event that your district is selected for monitoring, one of the uh, pieces of evidence we'll ask for are those enrollment summary reports and we'll compare the data on those to what's in the comparability report. So you want to make sure that you save the one that reflects the information um, that you've submitted to us for approval. You can also use the comparability report checklist to verify the accuracy of your report before submitting it in GMAP. You can find that checklist there at that link on our webpage. It's also included in the Excel workbook. Um, in the Excel workbook, you do not have to complete that page. That's just as a reference for you. We complete that page to mark it as approved. All right, and lastly, we have made some updates to some of our monitoring checklists, and this was just to increase the specificity and better align with ESSA. These checklists are located on our documents and resources webpage. Um, we updated the desk monitoring checklist, the district consolidated monitoring checklist, and the school-wide program consolidated monitoring checklist. Um, it's not a lot of huge changes. We added a few questions, removed a few, maybe changed the wording a little bit just to really align with ESSA. And um, we always encourage you to use those monitoring checklists to evaluate your district and school requirements throughout the year. And that is all for me, thanks. All right, I don't think I have gotten any questions in so far. Um, but uh, Aaron, you did talk about, uh, but if, you know, of course, if it, are there any, is there anything in the chat that we need to uh, uh, discuss? Any questions or comments or anything? It's taking a second to load for me. Nothing in there right now, Sarah. 
Okay, thank you, David. All right, then, um, Aaron's been talking about, she mentioned here on this slide about some updated monitoring checklists, and that kind of segues into our next topic on our homeless requirements, um, because there were some a few additions to the district monitoring checklist. Um, and so, uh, Missy is with us this morning, and she's, she's our state homeless coordinator, and she's going to talk to us about some of the provisions of our state homeless regulation, which is 704... <laughs> Uh, K-A-R colon 7090. Uh, some of these requirements, a few of them have been added to the district monitoring checklist. And so, Missy, can you talk to us about the amendments made to the register to the um, to this state regulation and provide us with some context for that, for those amendments? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Um, students experiencing homelessness are at particularly high risk for dropping out of school. Um, so that's why this, um, these amendments that have been made are, are really super important because high mobility and seat time policies often cause students to lose class time and result in a loss of credits or the inability to accrue credits. In addition to the barriers and unique challenges that students experiencing homelessness face, consideration needs to be given to the added susceptibility surrounding the transition from middle to high school. By providing needed credit accrual and recovery support to homeless students, districts help ensure that these students stay engaged in school and on track for graduation. So again, that's really important for these kids because if they're when they're highly mobile and they're having a hard time accruing credits, that compounds the risk for dropping out of school. Um, the Every Student Succeeds Act of 2015 placed new emphasis on high school graduation for students experiencing homelessness. In addition to, in addition to strengthening proven practices such as preschool enrollment and stability, improving identification, maximizing school stability, awarding partial credits, and ensuring access to extracurricular activities, S's amendments required states to report disaggregated graduation and achievement data for students experiencing homelessness. States and school districts must develop, review, and revise policies to remove barriers to identification, enrollment, and retention of McKinney-Vento students, including any barriers due to um, outstanding fees, fines, or absences. House Bill 378 was signed by Governor Bevan on March the 26th of 2019 and became law um, in June of that year. Um, House Bill 376 amended the statute requiring the Kentucky Board of Ed to provide through regulation procedures for homeless children to be awarded credit, including partial credit for all coursework satisfactorily completed. <laughs> and to be provided the opportunity to the extent practicable to complete at no cost before the beginning of the next school year any course required for graduation in which the student was previously enrolled and be awarded a high school diploma if the student has successfully completed the second year of high school and otherwise meets the requirements of the statutes. And we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Section two implements the statute which says that a homeless child transferring schools after successful completion of the second year of high school shall be awarded a high school diploma at the student's request by the local district from which the student transferred if the student me meets the graduation requirements of that district but is ineligible to graduate from the local district to which the student transferred or by the local district to which the student transferred if the student meets minimum requirements for high school graduation established by the KBE, but is ineligible to graduate from the district to which the student transferred and the district from which the student transferred. So that's a lot there. A so essentially what it's saying is a student experiencing homelessness who transfers school, uh, transfers schools anytime after completing the second year of high school is exempt from coursework and other graduation requirements of that school district that exceed state requirements unless the district determines the student is reasonably able to complete the district requirements in time to graduate by the end of the student's fourth year in high school. 
Section two also requires the homeless um, child education liaison or the homeless program coordinator to make personal and direct contact with the prior school of attendance. And you'll wanna make note there that it's not just contact, it's personal and direct contact, which is intended to help ensure that a, a homeless child's current district and the prior district of attendance maximize collaboration to ensure a more expedient and seamless transition in the best interest of the child. Section two also requires each district to adopt a methodology of calculating credit, which includes partial credit. And I think based on what we've seen in districts, partial credit may be the, the section that really needs some work. Um, so that method, methodology for calculating is really important. Uh, section two also requires districts to lessen the impact of transfers for homeless students by granting priority placement in classes that meet state minimum graduation requirements. And section two requires each district have written procedures clarifying how and what circumstances a homeless child would, will be able to complete be before the beginning of the next school year and at no cost any course required for graduation in which he or she was previously enrolled. Section two encourages districts to also provide homeless children flexible options for credit accrual, like personalized learning environments and alternative education programs, uh, which includes uh, credit recovery programs. Okay, we'll dive a little bit deeper into credit accrual. And as I mentioned at the top of this section, um, there's barriers to accruing credits for kids who are homeless and highly mobile that prevent them from um, meeting graduation on time and often causes them to drop out. Um, students experiencing homelessness face challenges in accruing credit, class offerings, methods of calculating credits and graduation requirements can vary greatly across school districts. Students who change schools late in high school can suddenly find themselves in danger of not graduating due to differing class and credit requirements. And high schools often have seat time rules that prevent youth from earning credits if they enter the district late or if they leave the district early. These various policies and requirements have a negative impact on youths whose homelessness forces them to change schools mid-year. So districts must have clear procedures in place to ensure that homeless students receive appropriate credit for full or partial coursework. Examples of such procedures include awarding credits for all courses satisfactorily completed at a prior school, even if the school was in a different district or in a different state. Consulting with a student's prior school about the student's coursework at that school. Informally or formally evaluating students' current mastery of courses partially completed in a prior school. Awarding partial credits and offering credit recovery courses. Um, so districts have the, the obligation to remove barriers to enrollment and retention for homeless students under the McKinney-Vento Act. Um, districts must have clear procedures to ensure that homeless students receive the credit for full or partial coursework. Um, this will help ensure students do not fall behind, even if they change schools mid-year or if they have employment-related obligations that can also become a barrier for kids accruing credits. Districts should cons consider the following strategies. Working to keep students in their schools of origin so they can avoid the challenges associated with school change. That's the number one thing. So transportation will be a big piece of any homeless education program is how, they, um, how you're gonna work to transport kids to their school of origin. Providing support to enable students to attend school consistently and progress academically awarding students partial credit for work completed, completing regular classes with independent study programs, um, including any learning labs, online learning, and computerized models. So any innovative ways to provide um, independent study programs. 
working with family courts and district personnel to create or improve diversion programs or alternative education programs is also a valuable strategy. And districts should consider connecting with um, after school networks. Many states provide mentors or STEM, uh, STEM instruction uh, that could greatly enhance a student's ability to make up work, either through increasing a student's understanding of the content or through a partnership that allows after school time to count toward classroom credit. And lastly, um, districts need to consider using uh, multi-tiered systems of support or positive behavioral interventions and supports uh, or response to intervention teams to identify uh, whether or not students are struggling due to the mobility and homeless issues or whether um, their lack of progress is due to other factors. All right, so just to recap and then we'll we'll stop and see if we have any questions. Um, as mentioned earlier, some of the requirements that you've been talking about, Missy, uh, have been added to the district monitoring form. And specifically, if you want to look at those, uh, they're on questions five through seven in the homeless section of the district monitoring form, which is posted on our documents and resources page. And then also coming soon, uh, we have a handout uh, that Missy's been working on, on credit accrual and high school completion for homeless students. And it provides a nice summary of the, uh, of the information that Missy has just presented. And we'll get that out to you all and to the homeless liaisons as soon as possible. Uh, Missy, there's one other thing I wanted to mention here. You know about our our survey, which we send to um, to districts every month, so they can, if they would like, they can provide us with some feedback about the webinars. And Erin uh, uh, had just sent that link out with her email, her reminder email this morning. That is the survey that I'm, I'm referring to. And oftentimes during a webinar, I like to share some of the responses that we've gotten. And we did get one last month that had a suggestion for a topic that related to homeless. And so um, I wanted to share that with you all. And the suggestion was, could we provide information on how GMAP works? So as a homeless coordinator, uh, districts can better support their Title I person with any changes to the budget. And so that sounds like a uh, maybe a higher level view of GMAP that would be tailored to the uh, homeless coordinator role. Um, it sounded to me like a very interesting and um, thoughtful suggestion. So um, what, what do you think about that, Missy? I think that's a really great idea. Um, many of our homeless uh, program coordinators already work really closely with the Title I coordinators. Um, in some cases, maybe um, not a lot, but in some cases, it could be the same person. So, um, yeah, there's a couple of sections on there that would be really great for um, homeless coordinators to know. Uh, more about and maybe see that in GMAP and that's our homeless set aside page and then um, the budget. So um, I think maybe a video, I think maybe Aaron and I could do a video that would be um, kind of give an overview of that and kind of lead into that collaboration at the district level between those two programs. Yeah, and we, we know that we've uh, talked about that before, about how important that collaboration really is. So, yeah, so I, I agree, and we'll want to discuss that further, but it, I really want to thank that uh, person who submitted that suggestion because it was, it you know, it was it was very good suggestion, and thank you for providing that us with that feedback. Um, if anybody else has any uh, feedback, please feel free to uh, fill out that survey. It's only five questions and responses are anonymous. So Missy, I think you have some resources that you wanted to share as well. Yes, these are resources that will um, help districts um, as you refine those processes and procedures that you already have in place and work on getting policies in place so that you have those those things written down. We know that you're already doing a lot of this work, but we just want to make sure that it's written down um, that, and that supports that communication across the district so that everyone involved, especially your school counselors, um, are aware of this. Um, so these resources will help with um, the overall rec change as well as that methodology for partial credit that we talked about. Um, there's a particular example that I gave from California. It um, partial credit policy model. It's for uh, 
their foster youth, but it, it really doesn't matter. It can be for any kid. It just gives you an outline of how to award partial credit. So that's a great example that you might want to look at. So those resources will help you refine and revise your policies and procedures. And then, of course, if you have any questions, be sure to um, give me a call or shoot me an email, and I'd be happy to help. Yeah, so there's uh, Missy's contact information on that slide. And of course, these slides uh, were sent this morning and will also be posted along with the uh, recording of the webinar. Um, and so I think the last thing before we close out is to see if there's any questions in the chat. I don't have any through email. I don't see anything in there, Tara. All right. Well, uh, we have some upcoming webinar dates here. Uh, those should be on your calendar already, but this is just a reminder. Thank you all again so much for joining us. Uh, if you do think of any questions, uh, please feel re uh, free to reach out to any of us with those questions, and we will try to get you a response as soon as possible. Um, Aaron, David, or Melissa, do you all have anything else that you would like to add at this point? I don't either. All right. Thank you all again so much for joining us, and I hope to see you soon at the next webinar.